Hello everyone, and welcome to another video. Today I'm just walking over here to the cows and I decided, I decided to give you a quick chat about why we choose British Friesian over Holston cows. It's been asked quite a lot on our channel and um, it's something that I said, a topic that I would spend a little bit of time discussing with you. It's fairly simple, there's no real um, mad science to it. Behind you here now, you can see our cows were just eating the bale I'm at put in this morning. So the main reason, main reason, these are all British Friesian. Now when I say British Friesian, um, they're about 70-80% on the British Friesian um, gene side. Um, we have have had Hostons. I have sold most of them on. We, I suppose they were more popular around here about seven, eight years ago. There would have been a few Hostons about. But they all had similar characteristics. Now, to start off, I'll just stand in here because it's very, very windy. As Storm Dennis is starting to starting to blow quite a bit. You might see the trees up there on the on the rising starting to move over quite a bit. So hoping you can hear me clearly now. I think we're in a wee bit of a shelter spot. So British Friesian, I like them because uh, they're very easy to maintain. Um, feet, health, everything's good with the British Friesian. They're a very, very strong and resilient breed. Um, now, Holston is quite popular on a lot of farms because uh, I suppose really in the simple fact of it is that they're a better producer of milk oil, which was thought they were a better producer of milk, which technically they are. But uh, you do have a lot more problems. Um, the finer the breed, same in any any type of animal, the finer the breed, uh, the more delicate or susceptible they are to picking up um, little bits of health issues, especially feet. Um, I've seen working on different farms that have had hosts and a lot of fairly purebred hostings on their farm and they've had a lot of trouble with feet. And an animal with bad feet, it does not produce much milk and it is, can become a nuisance when you get a large amount of them, especially when they're indoors this time of year. Um, so the British Friesian, we tend to have next to no trouble with feet. Might get the odd hoof that might grow a bit long. Um, I think the, we have a man that comes here once a year, maybe do two, maybe three cows every year. Um, maybe a shoe because they've got their feet damaged maybe on stone and on passes and things like that but everyone else um, has been very very straightforward with them easy calving they don't seem to have any trouble after calving as well they seem to bounce right back and and uh, and, and get out of it fairly quick um, again good selection of calves uh, you get a really good calf from them if again it all depends on picking the right type of, of straw we, we picked through what, what straws we're using to suit the cow that we're, we're doing. Um, and also, um, you know, make sure to try to keep, again, keep that British strain in the cow as much as possible. So we would look through a cow's history and see where, what her genetic type is, is and where she has really come from. And then we know um, what kind of percentage we can use um, of hosts and in her, if any hosts and whatsoever. So hopefully that kind of makes sense to you. Um, Again, I had a lot of farmers coming to me and asking me about, uh, you know, first question you're asked is, uh, of any calves you're selling, um, where do they come from? Is it a British region or a Holston? And, uh, you know, thankfully I can tell them that they're good calves because they generally are, they're good strong calves, which we we'll look at now in a few minutes. But um, yeah, you can, you can definitely see the strength in them. So. My choice was always British Friesian. Um, as I say, I don't want that hassle of, of dealing with health issues on them. Every year, without increasing our numbers, our milk supply is, is climbing. And once that's happening, I'm, I'm happy. We're all the time adjusting, using different straws and picking out um, you know, better selections. There's always new bulls coming on online. And uh, we work with Progressive Genetics and trying to find something that's suitable to our farm. And people have asked me why or how do you distinguish a uh, hosting from a British Friesian? Well, there are a couple of little things that you can look for. Um, one of which is size. Uh, a British Friesian uh, tends to be a slightly smaller animal and tends to carry more flesh, tends to be a little bit more heavy. Um, where the hosting uh, tends to be a little bit larger and a thinner overall animal. Um, another thing is people think that um, a Friesian cow is black and white, and black and white only. Well, that's not true. Um, there is actually a red and white Friesian as well. Um, although you don't see it as much. Years ago you would have seen it quite well. Thanks for the commentary. 
But uh, years ago, you would have seen it uh, a lot, um, but you don't see it as much now. Um, but I know that there is, uh, we've had them here years ago, our red and white Frisian, and I know uh, they're still very common in the Netherlands. They kind of pushed into the Netherlands now and uh, kind of disappear and everywhere else. So some of you might ask, uh, British, where did the word British come from? Or where did the British Frisian come from? Well, a lot of you might think that the word came from the animal originating in Britain, but that is completely wrong. These uh, British Frisian would originally um, came from a place called Friesland in the uh, Netherlands and that's where the British Frisian originated from. Um, Holston um, is just basically a better producing uh, Frisian cow. Um, they were bred basically for milk and milk alone and yes their milk production does tend to be much better. And a lot of you might ask me why I don't use a uh, bull, a stock bull. Yes, a stock bull would be very handy, um, especially just picking out because you can get a really good British Frisian uh, bull out there very, very easily. Um, but um, about 10 years ago, I suffered quite a bad injury from a stock bull that we had here and got uh, basically learnt my lesson, learnt my lesson the hard way, um, as a lot of farmers did. I got attacked by the bull and was very, very lucky to survive it. Um, and I just said to myself, I made that promise to myself, I'll never keep one again. Um, because you'll always take that chance. You might be as safe as safe can be. And that bull, particular bull that we had, was the quietest bull you could ever come across. Um, he used to walk behind the cows and you could nearly jump up on his back and go for a spin. He was 100%. He was really, really, really quiet. And then just one day when I was opening the gate, he... Um, he just came straight for me within seconds and uh, that was it. I was just very, very lucky. I was in the right kind of place in the field. I was able to get away from him before he could do more harm, but that's my reason for not keeping a stock bowl. Breeding season will be starting fairly soon. You're not finding it coming around the corner now and uh, we already have cows coming into heat to have calved in um, very early January, but we won't be doing anything, serving anything yet. We do we usually don't um, have cows calving until uh, the beginning of January, unless we had Unless there were a couple of cows, maybe there were um, early calving the year before or something, we might just put a couple of cows calving for Christmas as we did the year. But generally, from beginning of January onwards, we start, we like them all to calve, and um, start calving around that time and on into the, on into March, I suppose, middle of March, we aim for St. Patrick's Day to be kind of finished. That doesn't happen very often, but that's what we aim for. Uh, again, the leptospirosis causes problems, little bits of problems with left them cows as you can see. Here's a girl here, just in heat there now as you can see, she's going from one cow to the other. Um, 744, yeah, she was calved, I think, yeah, she would have been the first week in January. So um, it doesn't take them long, it's, it's good to see them cycling already. Um, but that's really it, that's the idea. Uh, Aberdeen Angus is used on our heifers when they calve. Uh, people are asking why do we use an Angus? Use it for a very simple reason. Easy calving. That's just as simple as that. Uh, we do pick, try to aim for a, for a good Angus calf as well at the same time, but something that's easy, easy calving. Now the ones we had this year were big Angus calves. Um, they weren't very easy calving, but they didn't cause any problems. And we've just 20 left now, and I know that we're gonna have 15 calved in the next uh, week and a half, so we're not gonna we're not gonna have too many late ones. So uh, I said I had a monster, monster of a calf, or a monster on the farm. Let's go and have a look at it. I uh, know that's not an Aberdeen Angus. That is actually Hudson. Hudson's a chocolate lab, and um, but he would nearly pass as an Angus. He's definitely heavy enough. Um, but that's my boy, my loyal companion. Goodbye, Hudson. And calves were born here last night and you will get to see what I mean about a monster. A calf here. And we have a calf born here last night. Um, it was a, a bull calf. Um, nice little calf, nice little handy calf. Very healthy. Um, yeah, after a second feed there this morning, uh, suck the bottle, no issues whatsoever. Lively, that's the way you like to see them. But down here, we'll show you a little, another little boy that was uh, born last night. This little lad here, well, I shouldn't say little lad because he's anything but, he's an absolute brute. Um, we'll open up the pen here. Have a little look. This boy was born 10 o'clock last night and yeah, he was a big one. 
lucky enough the cow we had put a Belgian blue into um, was a very very big cow she's actually a very old cow and we didn't really want a Frisian from her so we sometimes use a continental on the leg of them and usually we go for we usually go for a Belgian blue um, so she were on about 10 days by her time and I knew she was going to have a big calf when I seen I just knew by looking at her she was either going to have twins or a very big calf so she ended up having a, a monster of a calf um, but he is a super animal um, for being a few hours old um, but yeah everything went good she in the parlor this morning milked no problem whatsoever didn't didn't take a fidge out of her that's what I say I knew she was a big cow and be fit to handle it but that's one of our monsters on the farm um, last night So I have to go now and hook on the slurry tank because as you can see out there now Storm Dennis is well the rain parts here anyway it's definitely getting windier now every hour that passes so um I think it's given 33 hours of heavy rain so yeah not really what we want but um the tanks are all getting very full and um, there's one particular tank down there that I know is just back up almost at the slats again so I'm going to have to hook on the slurry tank now in the rain and take into it again and tank a few tanks out just to leave a bit of pressure off. But that tank over there, um, on that side of the slat house, you can see the yard, the collection yard for the cows milking runs into, into that uh, tank. And there's nothing we can do about it. When it rains heavy, it does catch a lot of water and it runs into that tank. A little mistake that was made on that years ago, that shed was built in 97 and uh, my father that time was running the show a little mistake that was made was that tank on that side didn't go onto the cubicles the one on this side did um, don't really know why my father done it that way if i had been building that shed i would have put one tank the whole length of the of the shed onto the passageway and everything as much storage as you can possibly get but i suppose it was just cost saving at the time when he built it and um it's something that we regretted later on there's uh case you might wonder before we go any further you might wonder why the case is sitting in the cabin pen well uh, uh for some reason this morning out the roof was actually uh leaking and um, there was a puddle of water in the floor of the of the cab and uh on the further investigation i realized the seal around the sunroof on that tractor i had um cracked and it was it was actually letting it just let water in. i don't know how it cracked because we never really used the sunroof but somehow or other the way the tractor was parked and the angle that it was in, it let water in. So I parked it in there for now because the machinery shed, I have um, another bit of equipment in there that I'm fixing fixing at the minute and uh, normally it goes in there. So I'll get it back into its own shed tonight. But uh, get it out of the rain, especially the rain that's coming. You don't want a holy roof. And another few people ask me, what the hell is this thing here? Um, sorry, I'm finning again. Oh, I'm behind the wall. So um, what is that? Well. You know what? Put it down in the comment box. A piece of timber with a T on the top of it. What do I use it for? And I'll tell you one thing it is, it's mighty handy. Somebody tell me, it's in the silage bit, what's it used for? Put it in the comment box below and in a few days time I'll uh, tell you all about it. As you see, kind of a little bit more in front of the camera this time. Um, so I do appreciate you watching our videos and if you haven't subscribed, please do so. And until then, catch you on the next one. Boom.